<laughs> Crestwood High School stood as an imposing ancient institution on the outskirts of town. For decades, it had been the epicenter of chilling stories and whispered legends. The massive structure, with its decaying facade and shattered windows, loomed over the landscape like a malevolent specter. Many believe that the school was cursed, its walls tainted by a dark and tragic history. The town had long buried the darkest chapter of Crestwood High's history, but it was time for the truth to be unveiled. Sarah, an intrepid journalist with a penchant for uncovering the unexplained, had made it her mission to expose the school's dark secrets. Armed with a determination to confront the past, she delved into the archives, unearthing a chilling tale of tragedy. The story began decades ago, when Crestwood High organized a fateful field trip into the dense woods bordering the town. A group of students, eager for adventure, set out with their teachers, their laughter and excitement filling the air. However, their journey would take a nightmarish turn, leaving a scar on the town's collective memory. Deep in the heart of the woods, the students and their teachers vanish without a trace. Search parties calmed the area, but all they found were eerie symbols etched into the trees and an unsettling sense of dread that permeated the forest. The town mourned their loss, but the incident left a haunting legacy that would endure for generations. Following the tragedy, Crestwood High became a place of fear and trepidation. Students reported strange occurrences, whispers in the hallways, apparitions in the windows, and unexplained phenomena. The townsfolk began to avoid the school, considering it cursed. Legends of the lost students and their restless spirits circulated, creating an atmosphere of unease. Sarah's investigation into Crestwood High's dark past led her to a treasure trove of forgotten documents and eyewitness accounts. She interviewed the few surviving witnesses who had been on the ill-fated field trip. Their recollections painted a harrowing picture of a nightmarish ordeal in the woods, where the boundaries of reality and the supernatural blurred. As Sarah delved deeper into her research, she discovered a series of eerie occurrences that had plagued Crestwood High over the years. Mysterious disappearances, sightings of ghostly figures, and inexplicable happenings suggested that the school was a hop of paranormal activity. Sarah's determination to uncover the truth led her to organize a daring exploration of the abandoned school. Sarah assembled a team of experts in the paranormal, a psychic medium, a historian, and a skeptical scientist. Together, they embarked on a midnight expedition to Crestwood High. Armed with an array of equipment, they entered the school with a mix of anticipation and dread, determined to uncover the source of the haunting. Inside the decaying school, the team encountered a malevolent presence that seemed to feed on their fear. Doors slammed shut on their own, objects moved without explanation, and eerie whispers echoed through the hallways. The psychic medium sensed the lingering souls of the lost students, tormented and seeking release. As they explored further, the team stumbled upon a hidden room a chamber filled with eerie symbols and a sense of foreboding. In the room, they uncovered a journal that belonged to one of the teachers on the ill-fated field trip. The journal detailed bizarre rituals performed in the woods and hinted at a dark force that had been awakened. As midnight approached, the team decided to conduct a seance in an attempt to communicate with the restless spirits. The psychic medium channeled their energies and the room was filled with a spectral presence. The spirits of the lost students materialized, their faces etched with anguish and longing. Through the seance, the team uncovered the chilling truth. The field trip had indeed taken a sinister turn when the students and teachers had inadvertently stumbled upon an ancient, malevolent entity buried within the woods. The entity had lured them into performing dark rituals, binding their souls to the forest. As the seance unfolded, the malevolent entity that had ensnared the souls of the lost students unleashed its fury. The school itself seemed to come alive, with walls shifting, rooms transforming, and a maelstrom of paranormal activity. The team found themselves in a battle for their lives as they fought against the entity's relentless assault. The team's struggle against the malevolent entity pushed them to the brink of madness. 
Sarah and her companions were subjected to nightmarish visions, their fears and regrets brought to life by the entity's supernatural power. It was a battle not just for their lives, but for their sanity. As the malevolent entity closed in, one member of the team, the historian, made the ultimate sacrifice. Drawing on the knowledge of the dark rituals from the journal, they confronted the entity head-on, offering themselves as a vessel to contain its malevolence. The sacrifice unleashed a cataclysmic battle between the entity and the historian's spirit. With the historian's sacrifice, the entity's grip on Crestwood High began to weaken. The team, battered and shaken, performed a cleansing ritual they had discovered in the journal. As they chanted incantations and symbols glowed with ethereal light, the malevolent force was slowly drawn away from the school. In a blinding burst of energy, the malevolent entity was banished, and the lost souls of the students and teachers were finally free. Their spectral forms ascended into a radiant light, their faces at peace after decades of torment. The curse that had plagued Crestwood High for generations was broken. As dawn broke, the team emerged from the school, exhausted and forever changed by their harrowing experience. Crestwood High, once a place of darkness and despair, stood silent and empty, but the malevolent legacy had been purged. The town, now aware of the truth, came together to honor the memory of the lost students and teachers. A memorial was erected in the woods, and the tragic events were acknowledged as a solemn part of the town's history. Crestwood High, no longer haunted by its past, began a process of renovation, breathing new life into its halls. The town's scars ran deep, and the haunting memories of Crestwood High would never truly fade. But as the years passed, the school transformed from a place of fear into one of resilience. The echoes of the forgotten were heard less frequently, replaced by stories of survival and redemption. Though the malevolent entity had been banished, the team knew that some mysteries were destined to remain unsolved. The woods that had harbored the darkness still held secrets, and the true nature of the entity that had ensnared the lost souls remained a haunting enigma. As the world turned and generations passed, Crestwood High and the surrounding woods stood as a reminder that the past could cast a long and chilling shadow, and that some mysteries were destined to remain shrouded in darkness for all eternity. <laughs>
She was drawn to Street Augustine's Detective Hospital by a mysterious calling, an inexplicable connection to the institution's history. Shortly after their arrival, strange occurrences began to plague the trainees. Objects moved on their own, chilling whispers echoed through the corridors, and a sense of unease settled over the hospital. Emily, with her keen intuition, was the first to sense that they were not alone within the decaying walls. Emily's visions led her to a disused wing of the hospital, where she encountered the spectral figure of Dr. Malcolm. His eyes held a tortured wisdom, and his spectral voice revealed the horrors of his final experiment, a forbidden ritual that had unleashed a malevolent force within the hospital. The malevolent force, a shadowy entity that thrived on fear and despair, had been set free by Dr. Malcolm's reckless experiment. It sought to consume the souls of the living and trap them in an eternity of torment. The hospital's tragic history had become a breeding ground for vengeful spirits. Emily, Detective Harris, and the trainees found themselves in a battle for their lives as they confronted the malevolent force. The hospital itself seemed to come alive, with walls shifting, rooms transforming, and a maelstrom of paranormal activity. They were subjected to nightmarish visions, their deepest fears brought to life by the entity's supernatural power. As the malevolent entity closed in, the trainees were pushed to the brink of madness. Emily's determination to uncover the truth about Dr. Malcolm's experiment had made her a target of the entity's fury. She was subjected to relentless psychological torment, her past traumas resurfacing with horrifying clarity. In the midst of the chaos, Emily had a revelation about the malevolent force's true nature. It was not merely a vengeful spirit. It was a manifestation of the hospital's collective trauma and the darkness that had festered within its walls for generations. To defeat it, they would need to confront the hospital's past and the secrets that had been buried for so long. In a desperate bid to banish the malevolent force, Emily made a harrowing sacrifice. Drawing on her connection to the hospital's history, she offered herself as a vessel to contain the entity's malevolence. The sacrifice triggered a cataclysmic battle between Emily and the malevolent force as the hospital's walls trembled and reality itself seemed to fracture. With the malevolent force weakened, Detective Harris and the remaining trainees performed a cleansing ritual that Emily had uncovered in her visions. As they chanted incantations and symbols glowed with ethereal light, the malevolent entity was drawn away from the hospital and into the light. In a blinding burst of energy, the malevolent entity was banished, and the lost souls of the hospital were finally free. They ascended into a radiant light, their faces at peace after decades of torment. Street Augustine's detective hospital, once a place of darkness and despair, had been cleansed of its malevolent history. As the dust settled, Detective Harris and the trainees emerged from the hospital, forever changed by their harrowing experience. Street Augustine's detective hospital, no longer haunted by its past, began a process of transformation, turning into a state-of-the-art detective training facility. The town, now aware of the truth, came together to honor the memory of those who had suffered within the hospital's walls. A memorial was erected, and the tragic events were acknowledged as a solemn part of the town's history. Street Augustine's Detective Hospital, once a place of fear, became a symbol of resilience and redemption. The town's scars ran deep, and the haunting memories of Street Augustine's Detective Hospital would never truly fade. But as the years passed, the hospital transformed from a place of dread into one of hope and renewal. The echoes of the forgotten were heard less frequently, replaced by stories of survival and redemption. Emily, forever connected to the hospital's history, continued to investigate the mysteries surrounding Dr. Malcolm's experiment. She uncovered long-buried documents and hidden records, gradually piecing together the full extent of the malevolent force's origins and the secrets that had been concealed for so long. As Emily's investigations continued, she realized that the malevolent force had not been fully vanquished. Its remnants still lingered, seeking to reclaim what had been lost. Emily, now a seasoned detective, knew that she would need to confront the malevolent force once more to protect the town and ensure that the hospital's dark legacy would never resurface. The malevolent force may have been banished from Street Augustine's detective hospital, but its legacy endured, 
As Emily delved deeper into the mysteries of the past, she realized that the malevolent entity was merely one piece of a larger, more sinister puzzle. The battle against the shadows was far from over, and Emily would need to face her own demons as she unraveled the town's deepest, darkest secrets. And so, the haunting legacy of Street Augustine's detective hospital continued, its echoes reaching far beyond its decaying walls, reminding all who encountered it that the past could cast a long and chilling shadow, and that some mysteries were destined to remain shrouded in darkness for all eternity. <laughs>The Johnson family, comprised of John, Sarah, and their two children, Emily and Ethan, embarked on a long overdue vacation to escape the daily grind. Their journey took them deep into a remote forest, where winding roads and towering trees created an enchanting yet unsettling atmosphere. The family arrived at a remote cabin deep within the woods. The cabin, rustic and charming, was the perfect retreat. It sat on the edge of a serene lake surrounded by the dense forest. But as night fell, an eerie feeling settled over the family, and strange sounds seemed to echo through the woods. As the days passed, the Johnsons explored the woods, hiking along hidden trails and enjoying the tranquility of nature. Yet each evening as darkness descended, mysterious noises pierced the silence. Whispers carried on the wind, and eerie laughter echoed through the trees leaving the family on edge. Odd occurrences began to plague the family. Personal belongings vanished without a trace, only to reappear in strange and unsettling locations. Emily's favorite doll appeared perched in the branches of a tree, and Ethan's backpack materialized in the middle of the lake. John and Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that they were being watched. One night, the family heard a tapping at the cabin's windows. When they investigated, they found a tall, shadowy figure lurking in the darkness. It vanished before they could react, leaving behind a lingering sense of dread. They decided to leave the next morning, but their car mysteriously refused to start. Trapped in the cabin, the Johnsons grew increasingly isolated. They ventured into the woods in search of help, but found themselves turned around and disoriented. The forest seemed to shift, its paths leading them in circles. Panic set in as they realized they were not alone in the woods. In their search for a way out, the family encountered ghostly apparitions. Figures clad in tattered clothing, their faces twisted in anguish, appeared and disappeared in the blink of an eye. The apparitions whispered tales of tragedy and sorrow, their presence a chilling reminder that the forest held a dark and haunted history. Desperation forced the Johnsons to investigate the forest's history. They uncovered a hidden diary from a previous inhabitant of the cabin, detailing eerie encounters and unexplained phenomena. The diary spoke of a malevolent force that dwelled in the woods, a force that fed on fear and sought to trap those who entered its domain. As the family delved deeper into the forest's secrets, they unwittingly unleashed the malevolent force. It manifested itself as a swirling, shadowy presence that sought to torment them. Their isolation and fear became the entity's playground, and it reveled in their terror. The Johnsons, now besieged by the malevolent force, faced a battle for their very souls. The entity tormented them with nightmarish visions, exploiting their deepest fears and regrets. Family bonds were strained as they struggled to maintain their sanity and find a way to escape the haunted woods. As the entity's grip tightened, each family member faced their own demons. Emily was haunted by the ghostly apparitions, Ethan confronted the loss of his belongings, Sarah was tormented by her inability to protect her family, and John battled his own insecurities and guilt. The forest had become a nightmarish labyrinth of horrors. In the midst of their suffering, Emily had a revelation about the malevolent force's true nature. It was not merely a vengeful spirit. It was a manifestation of the forest's dark history and the collective pain of those who had suffered within its depths. To defeat it, they would need to confront the forest's past and find a way to break the cycle of torment. Emily, driven by her newfound understanding, made a harrowing sacrifice to confront the malevolent force. She willingly offered herself as a vessel to contain its malevolence, drawing upon the forest's history and her connection to it. 
The sacrifice triggered a cataclysmic battle between Emily and the malevolent entity, as the very fabric of the forest seemed to unravel. With the malevolent force weakened, the remaining family members performed a cleansing ritual they had uncovered in the diary. As they chanted incantations and symbols glowed with ethereal light, the malevolent entity was drawn away from the forest and into the light. In a blinding burst of energy, the malevolent entity was banished, and the tortured souls of the forest were finally free. They ascended into a radiant light, their faces at peace after centuries of torment. The forest, once a place of darkness and despair, had been cleansed of its malevolent history. As the dawn broke, the Johnsons emerged from the forest, forever changed by their harrowing experience. The forest, no longer haunted by its past, began a process of renewal, with new life and growth taking root. The family returned home, their bonds stronger than ever. They carried with them the haunting memories of the whispering woods, but also a newfound sense of resilience and unity. The forest, once a place of fear, had become a symbol of their enduring strength. The whispering woods would forever be a place of eerie legends, a testament to the darkness that could linger in the most unsuspecting of places. The Johnsons knew that the past would always be a part of them but they had emerged from the forest with a renewed appreciation for the fragile balance between the natural world and the supernatural forces that could be unleashed within it. In the years that followed, Emily, now an adult, dedicated her life to understanding the mysteries of the Whispering Woods. She continued to research the forest's history, uncovering forgotten tales of tragedy and despair. Each revelation brought her closer to understanding the dark forces that had once held the forest in their thrall. The Whispering Woods remained a place of intrigue and caution, its secrets hidden beneath a canopy of ancient trees. It served as a reminder that the natural world held mysteries beyond human comprehension, and that the past, no matter how buried, could still reach out to grasp the living in its chilling embrace. And so, the legacy of the Whispering Woods endured, its echoes carried on the wind, a haunting reminder that some mysteries were destined to remain shrouded in darkness for all eternity. <laughs>
The bear didn't move an inch. Richie gave it a few more times, so long and loud that by the end of it we were dizzy. We started up the trail in a daze, dragged along by the animal despite all our natural instincts. At this point, we just needed to know, why isn't he moving? We moved closer, both of us aiming our bear cans, ready for the slightest twitch. But there was none. We pulled ourselves up and turned around to face him. It was like a dream. It was staring at us, a mouth open with yellowed teeth, sharp enough to tear through bone, and an outstretched paw with claws so long they didn't even look real. None of those things were real. Not really. Because it wasn't real. That is, it wasn't alive. Not anymore. It was a stuffed animal. What the hell is going on here? Richie threw a rock at it, just to be sure. It bounced off the bear's unblinking glass eye. We couldn't help ourselves. We started laughing. It was so weird, but at the same time very cool. This must be the place for the camp photo shoot, said Richie. Haven't you heard of it? Asked me. Richie pulled out his cell phone to Google it, but predictably, there was zero connection. We were far away. Instead, we just embraced the idea and took selfies with the grizzly. So Dan, ignorant and stupid, not thinking about the fact that we were standing next to one of the biggest predators on the planet, but something, someone had killed it. What hope did we have? After surveying every possible Instagram angle, we continued deep into the forest. Judging by the map, the campground was still a few miles away. It had to be one of those shared cabins that any hiker can use. This trail is not like the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Trail, where many people pass through every year. I hadn't even heard of it. This is all thanks to Richie and his obscure internet research. He's always trying to find something off the beaten path, a something cooler than everyone else. After that, things were good for a while. We got back into our usual rut of not wasting time and rode off the bear as being kind of unserious and fun. Then came the meadow and the deer. There were 12 of them, white-tailed, 10 doe and two males. None of them moved, always grazing among the wildflowers. They looked at us with their big black doll's eyes. This time we didn't wait. It was immediately obvious that they were also fed up. We got off the trail and walked among them, stroking their painted wet faces and frozen wiggly tails, touched the large horns meant to attract mates. Was it the same thing? Was someone trying to lure us in? You mean none of the sights mentioned them? I asked. Richie shook his head, half in amazement, half in fear. Who did this? Said I. We took pictures again, though our smiles were much more forced. If this was just some weird tourist trap, it was losing its appeal. Quickly, we walked on. The squirrel took forever to find acorns. The raccoon was climbing to treetops he would never reach. Birds sat silently on branches with songs lodged in their feathery throats. A coyote, howling, waited for a moon he would never see. I asked to go back. I didn't like this anymore. It wasn't right, but the sun was setting and neither of us wanted to walk back in the dark, even though the forest seemed completely devoid of real life. Both predators and victims, finally we reached the campground. All that was there was a campfire and a small shed. I not a real hut. I was really hoping for something with a lockable door, but once we got the fire going, the fear subsided a bit. It was supposed to be a week-long hike, but we both decided we would head home in the morning. I couldn't wait. I counted down the hours, trying to sleep. I couldn't hear a cricket or an owl. We were awakened by a buzzing sound. It was so high-pitched that it must have been on the verge of being audible to human ears. It was deep into the night. The fire was burning faintly, barely, but as I looked around, I saw another glow coming from the forest. The pines glowed a white-green, pulsing light, and something mechanical pulsed in my head. Richie and I looked at each other, confused and frightened looks frozen on our faces. I wanted to scream. I wanted to scream and not stop until I was safely in my bed. 
I wanted the ruby shoes to just click and disappear from this moment. But all I had were dirty shoes. There was nothing left for us to do but huddle against the back wall of the awning and pray for it to end. I closed my eyes and asked God to save us. It seemed we were not alone. The sky began to fill with the screams of dead or dying creatures. They were howling with primal fear, trying to free themselves from whatever was out there behind the trees. I don't know how long it went on. It seemed like it would never end. And then suddenly, it was morning. I don't remember falling asleep again. It was as if someone had turned on the light, and here I was, and Richie was gone. He wasn't anywhere in the camp. I ran back down the path in the direction we had come from. I kept shouting Richie's name, but there was no answer. My legs and lungs were burning. I was ready to do this all the way back to the car. I wasn't going to stop. But then I did stop. I had no choice. I rounded a bend in the trail, and there stood Richie, looking at where the rest of the trail used to be. Now there was a wall of thorny shrubbery twelve feet high and impenetrable. It stretched into the forest on either side of the trail, with no end in sight. Richie's arms, legs, and face were covered in bloody scratches as he turned to face me. I think we're lost, he said without any emotion. He dropped the crumpled map from his hands. I'm sorry, he said. This was supposed to be fun. Back at camp, I treated Richie's wounds with the first aid kit and tried to navigate the map. There is only one trail in and one trail out. Since the way back was closed, we would just have to move forward. A few hours walk ahead was a small town. The note said it was a good place to stop for supplies, as it was the only civilization for a few days. That's where we headed. Not that we had any choice. I walked in front. Richie was practically in a catatonic state. He walked behind, completely silent. His fears seemed to have vanished, replaced by something worse. He was determined to accept whatever fate had in store for him. I tried to talk to him about what had happened that night, tried to theorize about our situation, but all I got in response was a dummy look. He must have been in a state of shock. I know he was. As we walked, we continued to encounter all sorts of woodland creatures. Rabbits stood next to their dead burrows. A rattlesnake drew back to strike with its mute maracas. A pack of wolves circled around an old elk, towering so high that its antlers touched the branches of the surrounding spruce trees, covered in sawdust. His hide was moth-eaten and peeling in places. How long ago had this dramatic scene taken place? Years? Decades? Our feet carried us kilometer after kilometer. Our minds were numb. Each new picture of the natural world was even more incredible than the last. We hardly noticed anything anymore. The first thing I saw was the steeple of the church. A white tower with a gleaming cross shining in the midday sun. It looked like hope. Appearances can be deceiving. We ran the last few hundred yards to the edge of town. The trees gave way to neat manicured lawns and a small main street of brick and storefronts. Richie and I felt the trance lift away from us, and tears ran freely down our cheeks. We had always thought of ourselves as forest people, much happier in nature than among humans. Now I felt like I could kiss the first stranger I met. But it didn't turn out that way. There was still no cell service, so we headed for the gas station, hoping there was a phone or an understanding clerk there. We were in the middle of a vast emptiness, but there was a road which meant someone could pick us up. I saw a dilapidated booth and picked up the phone, but to my surprise, there was no dial tone. Fantastic. We walked into the station store. The fluorescent lights were humming. The radio was playing old country music from a skinny speaker, but the man behind the counter said nothing. When I asked if we could use the phone, he ignored us. So much for small town charm, I thought, wishing he was just being rude. Perhaps he had once been like that. I'll never know. All I know is that when I approached the counter, his bloodshot eyes didn't blink. His greasy, bearded mouth made no attempt to speak. His fingers worked the cash register for customers he couldn't see. He smelled faintly of formaldehyde hide and leather. He was just another stuffed animal. The work of a skilled taxidermist. A trophy. 
I fainted. When I came to, Richie was sitting on the floor next to me, with a sour pile of vomit lying next to him. Sorry, he said. Couldn't help myself. I could barely see him through my tears. What are we going to do? I asked. Maybe it's okay, he said. It could be some kind of weird art installation. Or a prank. No. No, it's not. I said. Yes. I know. We gathered our strength and stood up. We checked the phone behind the counter with the same result. Just as dead as the clerk. We walked out into the middle of the deserted street like gunmen at noon. Mace cans in our hands instead of guns. We did the only thing we could do. We looked around. Every corner, every building was an intricate work of the commonplace and the everyday. There were children playing in the front yard, one of them ready to throw a bleached and deflated red ball. The mailman seemed to whistle as he worked, and the dog barked at his intrusion. The butcher was slicing a lacquered ham on a slicer not even plugged in, and his wife was smiling, and seemed to be asking him not to make it too thin. Dull-eyed drivers sat in cars that never finished turning into their driveways. Families prayed over food that had gone cold but would never go bad. We sought help at the police station. It was like a scene from the Andy Griffith show put on pause, only if Andy and Barney's skin had turned waxy, green and gray. I borrowed a walkie-talkie from one of the officers, having no idea what the range might be, but figured it was worth a try. I really hope someone can hear this right now. It's hard to imagine there's anyone out there right now. But if there is, tell my family that I love them, and I'm sorry. Richie and I decided to spend that night at the church. I don't know if I ever believed in God, and I probably believe less now than I ever did, but it seems like if there was ever a time to pray, it was now. The people in the pews, all in their Sunday clothes, even though it's Tuesday, look serene. The preacher seems to be yelling about fire and brimstone, but they don't seem to mind. They are all models of serenity. I want the same thing they do. Tranquility at the gates of hell. I wake up from a dream. It was beautiful and noisy. So much beautiful noise. Traffic, honking horns, and rude drivers. TVs with annoying daytime shows. Kids playing, dogs barking. Rap music, country music, rock and roll blasting out of the speakers, people laughing, crying, screaming. There was a lot of screaming. Was that Richie? I run out of the sanctuary and into the street. It's bright outside. There's not a cloud in the sky. Just blue. So much blue. With a sky like that, nothing can go wrong. Richie is standing there looking at it too soaking it all in. The whole thing was just nightmarish, so silly what the trail can do to your head. What a day it's been, Richie. Isn't it amazing? He doesn't answer, but I understand. Sometimes this world, and everything in it, can overwhelm you. When I was a kid, I learned a verse from the Bible. Be still, and know that I am God. He is. He's just stunned that it's all so amazing. It has to be. It has to be. I'm just going to leave it for a while. We'll both just be calm. <laughs>
He'd engage them in long, rambling conversations about his life, his past, and his growing fascination with their family. The Richards family couldn't help but feel like they were constantly under surveillance. As time passed, Robert's obsession with the Richards family became more evident. He started leaving intricate drawings on their doorstep, portraits of John, Lisa, and their children. Each drawing was hauntingly detailed, capturing the family's every expression and nuance. The drawings were unsettlingly accurate. The late-night disturbances began. John and Lisa would awaken to the sound of soft music playing from next door. When they investigated, they found Robert standing in his yard, his eyes locked on their bedroom window. He claimed he was simply enjoying the music, but the Richards knew something was terribly wrong. The silent stares from Robert became a daily occurrence. He'd stand at his window, gazing at the Richards' house for hours on end. The unnerving silence weighed heavily on the family, creating an atmosphere of constant unease. One morning, the Richards family found a series of handwritten notes on their doorstep. The letters were filled with disturbing declarations of Robert's love for Lisa and his desire to become a part of their family. The notes hinted at a darkness lurking beneath his seemingly harmless facade. Robert's intrusion into their lives continued to escalate. He hacked into the Richards' computer and personal devices, leaving ominous messages and chilling photos that hinted at his ever-growing obsession. The family's sense of security crumbled as their privacy was violated. Tensions within the Richards' household grew as they struggled to cope with the constant fear and paranoia. Emma and Ben's innocence was shattered as they witnessed their parents' distress. The family felt trapped, unsure of how to escape the relentless grip of their psychotic neighbor. The Richards turned to the authorities, reporting Robert's erratic behavior and the escalating threats. The police investigated but found no concrete evidence of criminal intent. Robert, skilled at maintaining a facade of normalcy, appeared harmless to the outside world. Desperate to protect their family, the Richards decided to isolate themselves, cutting ties with friends and family. They transformed their home into a fortress, installing security cameras and reinforcing doors and windows. Their lives revolved around avoiding Robert's relentless pursuit. The constant stress and fear pushed the Richards family to the brink. John's once steady hand shook. Lisa battled insomnia and paranoia, while Emma and Ben's childhoods were mared by anxiety and nightmares. They were a family teetering on the edge of collapse. In a desperate attempt to expose Robert's true nature, John embarked on a covert investigation. He uncovered a hidden room in Robert's basement, a chamber filled with a chilling collection of mementos, photographs, and journals documenting his obsession with the Richards family. Armed with evidence, John confronted Robert in a high-stakes showdown. Robert's mask of normalcy shattered, revealing a twisted obsession that went far beyond their worst fears. He declared his intention to become part of their family no matter the cost. Realizing that their lives were in grave danger, the Richards family plotted their escape. Under the cover of darkness, they fled their home, leaving behind everything they knew in a desperate bid for freedom. But Robert was not far behind, determined to reclaim what he believed was rightfully his. The Richards' escape turned into a harrowing chase through unfamiliar territory. With Robert hot on their trail, they navigated treacherous terrain and encountered a series of perilous obstacles, all while battling fear and exhaustion. In a remote cabin deep in the wilderness, the Richards family made their final stand. Armed with their evidence and their determination to protect their loved ones, they confronted Robert in a tense and deadly showdown that would determine their fate. Years later, the Richards family still carried the scars of their traumatic encounter with their psychotic neighbor. They had relocated, trying to rebuild their lives. The experience had left them forever haunted by the knowledge that sometimes the most terrifying monsters lived right next door, hidden behind a facade of normalcy. The nightmare was far from over. Despite their escape, the Richards family knew that Robert still lurked in the shadows, his obsession unrelenting. They lived in constant fear that he would resurface, a chilling reminder that some horrors could never be truly escaped. And so, the legacy of Robert's madness endured, its echoes reaching far beyond the quiet streets of Willowbrook Heights, a haunting reminder that sometimes 
the most terrifying horrors could be found in the seemingly ordinary. The Richards family's escape had brought them to a remote, isolated town in a distant corner of the country. They hoped the vast distance would be enough to keep them safe from Robert's relentless pursuit. But as the years passed, their lives became a constant cycle of fear and paranoia. No matter where they went, the Richards remained on constant alert. Their once peaceful existence was now mirrored by security measures and precautions. They installed high-tech alarm systems, reinforced every entrance, and became experts in evading surveillance. They watched their neighbors closely, terrified that any unfamiliar face might be a sign of Robert's return. The toll on the Richards' emotional well-being was immeasurable. John, once a jovial and outgoing man, became withdrawn and consumed by guilt. Lisa struggled with debilitating anxiety and frequent panic attacks. Emma and Ben, robbed of their innocence, carried the trauma of their childhood with them into adulthood. The nights were the worst. Sleep remained elusive as nightmares and flashbacks of their harrowing past haunted their every moment of rest. The family members would often awaken in a cold sweat, their hearts pounding, convinced that they could hear Robert's menacing whispers just beyond the walls. A decade after their escape, the phone began to ring in the middle of the night. A voice, disguised with heavy modulation, taunted them with cryptic messages and eerie threats. The chilling familiarity of the voice sent shivers down their spines, and they knew that Robert was still out there, lurking in the shadows. Despite their best efforts, Robert continued to find ways to torment them. He sent disturbing packages to their new home, each one more unsettling than the last. Photographs of their daily lives, accompanied by eerie notes, served as a constant reminder that he was never far behind. One fateful evening, as John was returning home from work, he found his car vandalized with ominous messages scrawled in blood-red paint. Panic surged through him as he realized that Robert had somehow tracked them down once more, despite their tireless efforts to remain hidden. As the threats escalated, the Richards family was forced to live a life of secrecy and isolation. They distanced themselves from friends and colleagues, concealing their past and the terrifying specter that continued to haunt them. The burden of their shared secret weighed heavily on their shoulders. Desperation drove them to seek help from experts in cybersecurity and personal protection. They changed their identities, relocated yet again, and adopted new aliases. They lived in constant fear of the day Robert would discover their latest sanctuary. Despite their best efforts to stay hidden, Robert's relentless pursuit seemed never-ending. The family remained trapped in a never-ending nightmare forever looking over their shoulders, forever haunted by the knowledge that they could never truly escape the horrors of their past. And so, the legacy of Robert's madness endured, its echoes reaching far beyond the quiet streets of Willowbrook Heights, a haunting reminder that some nightmares could never be outrun, and some terrors could never be laid to rest.